Before we start the podcast, I want to highlight upcoming events for documentary fans. If you're in New York City on Tuesday, February 26th, look out for Doc NYC's Editing Boot Camp at the IFC Center. The day-long workshop features five masterclasses with the editors of acclaimed documentaries such as Free Solo and OJ Made in America. If you're in Miami on March 1st, I'll be giving a day-long workshop called Make Your Documentary that offers insights into every step of the process from conception and financing to production and distribution. The workshop takes place on the first day of the Miami Film Festival. I'll be at the festival all that week presenting several films that I discussed on episode 94, including Knock Down the House, Apollo 11, and Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool. For more information on the New York Editing Boot Camp and the Miami Make Your Documentary Workshop, go to docnyc.net. Now on to our show. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of Doc NYC. In this episode, we bring you a conversation about pushing boundaries in documentary style with the directors of Three Identical Strangers, Shirkers, and the Oscar-nominated Hale County This Morning, This Evening. For each of these filmmakers, it was their first time directing a feature-length work. This conversation took place in November at the Doc NYC Pro Conference. It's the fourth and final discussion in a series covering the filmmakers from the Doc NYC shortlist, where our programming team picks 15 of the year's most impressive nonfiction films. You can hear the three prior conversations covering the topics of political docs on episode 90, biographical docs on episode 91, and personal docs on episode 95. In this discussion, each of the three films pushes boundaries of traditional documentary formats. We'll start with Tim Wardle, director of Three Identical Strangers. His film investigates a case of New York triplets who were separated at birth. They discovered each other's existence in college and became minor celebrities in the 1980s. I wouldn't believe the story if someone else were telling it, but it's true, every word of it. It started when I went to college. It was the first day of school. All these people are coming up to me saying, Eddie, how are you? Eddie, hi. I'm like, my name's not Eddie. I don't know what you're talking about. As soon as this guy turned around, I knew it was Eddie's double. I said, you're not going to believe this. You have a twin brother. Oh, my God. As I reached out to knock on the door, it opens. And there I am. His eyes are my eyes, and my eyes are his eyes, and it's true. And then the story went from being amazing to incredible. It was an article to Twins Reunited. I think I might be the third. When people ask me what is the most remarkable story you ever encountered, I tell them it's the story of the triplets. You guys have been on the front page of every newspaper in the world. True. true. They were more like clones than they were like brothers. It was a miracle. There was nothing that could keep us apart. That's when things kind of got funky. What they didn't realize is that they had been the subject of a shady scientific study. In the making of Three Identical Strangers, Tim and his crew uncovered new details about the case. His filmmaking style combines new interviews with archival footage and impressionistic recreations of the past. He works with the UK production company Raw, known for the documentary The Imposter, that also used artful recreations. I asked him how he met the challenges laid out by this story. My background as a filmmaker, I come from a really kind of, in the UK, we have a real kind of observational tradition, a kind of veritary tradition of filmmaking, which is very, um, it's a very kind of prescribed approach. You know, you don't have commentary, you don't have pop music, you don't, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of kind of rules. And I guess quite early on, I realized to tell this story, I was going to have to use 
all kinds of different elements of filmmaking and, and, and break free of these kind of constraints from this observational technique. I think one of the things we've got is obviously some reconstruction at the top of the film. Initially, I was very reluctant to use it. I'm very ambivalent about reconstruction. But what I realized is for people to really um, go on an emotional journey with this film, which for me is what filmmaking is about, it's having an emotional connection with your audience, what I needed to do was align the audience with the brother's perspective. And to do that, we had to encounter things and, and discover uh, information as they discover it. So the perspective for most of the film is very much forced from their perspective. And so to do that, there are early scenes in the film where one of the brothers goes to college and you saw in the trailer and gets mistaken for, for someone he isn't. And there's no pictures of that time because before they were famous no one took pictures of them particularly um, and so if we wanted to use that perspective and to follow follow it th follow the their journey we had to had to do that reconstruction and that was that was a difficult decision to make but you know I think it was the right one um, but as Tom says you know there are two very different kinds of filmmaking I, I think they're almost like almost different genres you've got past tense stories where you've got you know archive reconstruction um, interview, you've got all these different kind of techniques, and then you have present tense verite, and we have both in, in, in this film, and, and tr managing that transition between the two is tricky. There's a moment in the film where the guys in interview get up and walk out, um, and, and, and like the, the, the interview space suddenly becomes like a verite kind of observational space. And that wasn't something that we knew we were going to do coming into. And it was, you know, we, we just left the camera running when they got up and walked out. It wasn't like that was planned. But I think very quickly in the edit, I realized, you know, we needed something to kind of manage that transition because the two styles of documentary are so different. Observational footage and observational filmmaking is very... Um, it's very loose. There's a lot. There's a lot more fat on it than there is on on, on past tense stuff, where you can cut everything. Almost, you can structure it like a like a um, narrative film. You know, that's very tightly edited. Observational filmmaking has an entirely different rhythm, and so to make the two work, we needed this kind of decompression space between the two. Our second speaker is Sandy Tan, the director of Shirkers. When Sandy was a teenager growing up in Singapore, she was part of a tight knit circle that included two other young women her age, Jasmine and Sophie, and a middle-aged American man named George. They set out to make a film. When I was 18, the thing I wanted more than anything was to make a movie. I had the idea that you found freedom by building worlds inside your head, that you had to go backwards in order to go forwards but I never imagined it would end this way. Whenever you're ready. Now. Oh, oh, In the summer oh, of 1992, oh, my friends and I shot a road movie oh, on the streets of Singapore oh, called Shirkers. Oh, oh, I was the screenwriter oh, and played the heroine, a 16-year-old killer named S. Did you feel it was childish? Yeah, but that was the beauty of it, right? Oh, oh, our passion and our earnestness came through. Sophie was the producer. Jasmine was the editor. George was the director. Were you rolling? Yeah. I chose George as my new best friend. A man of unplaceable age and origin. After shooting wrapped, he took everything. George was gone. And so was Shirkers. It would take nearly 20 years before Sandy finally regained the 16mm reels to her fiction film, Shirkers. She incorporates that footage into her documentary, that seeks to explore what happened. The film is visually dazzling as it shuttles between the 1990s and present time. I asked Sandy what was her concept for the documentary when she started. The concept for it was, was hard to come to, actually, because I, I, first of all, you know, I received the boxes of the film back and it was arrived at my house in like 2011 and 2012 and I was already moved on. I kind of shoved this 
traumatic episode aside and had become a different person. I'd become a novelist and, you know, having to revisit this was, was, was greatly traumatic. It took me three years to kind of open up the boxes and look at, look at the film and, and, and think about what to do with this. Um, one of the biggest hurdles was that I had to involve myself in telling of the story. I just didn't want to be in it because I, I'm also like, as you can see from the footage, the, the trailer, that I was also the lead character in that old film from 1992. And, and part of me was just horrified at seeing myself. And one of the biggest hurdles in telling the story was, can I tell the story without myself being involved? Um, and it was actually a friend, a great editor, uh, Inat Sidi, who, who, um, who, 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 who edited um, One of Us, and Jesus Camp, and The Wolf Pack. And she looked at my archive and looked at all the stuff, and she said, Sandy, don't you realize you can't tell this story? It's about you, um, you know. And, and then I had to deal with me. Um, so I tried to kind of recapture what it was to be um, a, a kind of an eighteen-year-old before I made Shirkers, and just recapture what was in roiling in my mind and what you know. So um, before I could tell the story of the, the 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 filmmaking and my friends who got involved and um, the whole thing, it was like basically trying to recapture the cadence and the rhythms of a life, like my life, um, and getting my friends involved in this. And one of the other things, of course, making a documentary rather than a fiction or just a personal thing where it's just me musing about this thing in a self-indulgent manner, um, was having to involve the other people whose, whose lives were actually kind of, you know, you know, sucked into a black hole with this, the, this, the, the, the theft of the film as well. And that was getting in touch with my um, former friends, I guess, and that took a lot of research and persuasion and, um, uh, pain, <laughs> um, getting them back in, 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 into this thing and telling our story as, as a whole as well as just mine. Our third and final speaker is Ramel Ross, director of Hale County, This Morning, This Evening. The film is set in the Black Belt of Alabama, cotton country, immersing us into the lives of two young African-American men and their families. I first encountered the film in 2014, is a jury member for the Garrett Scott Development Grant that provides mentoring to first-time filmmakers. Ramel's work sample stood out amongst the other applicants for its striking imagery that reflects his background as a still photographer. But the sample was very impressionistic with scarcely any dialogue. I imagine the project would develop more traditional narrative elements, but Ramel stuck to his more poetic vision, and that boldness was rewarded with numerous honors, including the Gotham Documentary Award and an Oscar nomination. I asked Ramel how he chose the film's style. Um, yeah, I think pretty early into the project, maybe three or four years, um, sorry, three or four months into the project, made a, an edit or two. Um, and the edit r very much resembled sort of the uh, traditional language of documentary, specifically as it relates to the representation of um, black folks and the, sort of the African American e experience. And so, sort of r reflecting that what I consider to be a, a problem or sort of trap of, of knowledge or assumed knowledge um, started to like build using respond directly to like the content that was there. Um, and then, you know, sort of the mantra or the, the, the creed of the film began to, to like have a couple of goals. I think somewhere around like five or six like things that weren't as important, that weren't more important than each other, which I don't remember all of, but I, I can say like, I wanted to sort of address the sort of trappings of narrative, um, the trappings of story. Um, wanted to sort of, uh, wanted to use black skin as content um, sort of acknowledge that, you know, the, the sort of the media landscape as it relates to black folks is a sort of Rorschach test for your experience with the community, um, white or black, um, or everything else. Um, wanted to sort of create a film that was a an actual experience of what it's like to perhaps participate in someone's life and to be there and in so sort of like proceed words in some, in some, in some way. Um, and, um, yeah, I think those are the ones I kind of remember, but sort of working together. 
Sandy, in the interview I did with you on Pure Nonfiction, you talk about the importance of having a tribe as an artist. You talk about in Singapore when you were a teenager, you had your tribe of people that you were able to make this first film. And then when you made uh, the, the documentary version of Shirkers, you gathered a new tribe. And, and you talk about Anat Sidi as an example of, of someone who uh, you know, what was a, a participant in uh, in this process? I I'd, I'd love to hear from each with of you, starting with you, Sandy, to talk about you know those other allies and advocates for your for your film because each of you is trying to do something different. It's not that easy to explain. It maybe doesn't fit into you know a a, 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 a neat pitch box. Um, and uh, and so how did people you know come to believe in what you were doing and what did that mean to you it was extremely difficult trying to convince people to to get involved in this in this thing um you know because the footage first of all like i had to produce the you know the 16 millimeter footage before people could believe that this thing existed and that looked the way it did um before i could begin pitching to other people um and finding a tribe like i i tried to make this film pretty much in the same spirit of the way I made Shirkers as a teenager, um, you know, handpicking people and just going at it and, you know, um, believing in this thing together. Um, uh, so once, you know, you're talking about, I guess, pitching and getting people involved and that kind or of thing. At, you know, just, any, at any stage, you know, yeah. who were the kind of key people it was really who, who hard. said, I understand what you're yeah. doing? Let me tell you, it was really hard finding a producer to to want to believe in me and to know what I'm talking about and working on this alone. So I pretty much worked on this as my own producer, um, and a lot of people who are kind of more, you know, advanced and, and um, well-connected were kind of horrified that I was kind of doing this alone and editing in my garage with a, an editor who was actually pretty much untried. Um, but his name is Lucas Seller. I think he's really talented. Um, he was very good at sitting with me and trying out things with me, and we discovered this. Uh, he's a, actually a skateboarder. I mean, his, he was actually discovered as a barista at Starbucks by Jeff Fusick when he needed an assistant on um, his film, author, um, the J.T. Leroy story. And um, Lucas, you know, it was just game. And and so Jeff said, you know, he recommends his Boy Scout because I couldn't afford to hire a real editor, a grown-up editor. I didn't have a producer. Um, it was just me. So I, I, I took a chance on Lucas. We kind of, like, really gelled on... on mood and he, he was young enough to understand and what and and kind of remember what it was like to be, you know, hell raising eighteen year old trying to make movies. Um he was twenty seven and a skateboarder. It was a little old to be a skateboarder by then. Um so we, we sat together and just like listened to music and built these collages and um and I realized very early on, like uh maybe a nine months or a year before we even began working together, I needed a sound designer because I wanted to get sound and soundtrack and you know the mood of everything in because we were to trying to take people into my head um, for the, the course of this movie, and, and it was very important that we use, utilize all the elements that were available to us in cinema. So that meant sound design, um, sound mixing, and uh, um, uh, you know soundtrack composer. So I found these, um, you know, talking about tribe in the 21st century. I found uh, these songs by the Singapore Live Looper. Her name is Wei. She was a school teacher inspired by Shirka. She quit her job as now she's a professional musician but um but she was a, sc a school teacher who had these two like wonderful songs she gave me and i had i found this um composer in israel whose name is ishai adar and he um he sampled her songs and kind of wove them through the soundtrack of this film and i worked with him really early as well talked to him about you know nine months before we began really working together and then i worked with um lawrence everson who's a great sound designer in la um we began talking i mean i wouldn't be able to afford working with him you know, until right at the end, just before, you know, picture locking and everything. Um, but we began talking. This conversation, I think, was so crucial that nine months to a year before I started putting ideas in his head, um, I showed him really just rough little 25-minute, you know, cuts and just like bits and pieces and just told him what I was going for and giving him words to work with in his mind so he could think about, like, how, you know, we had very little footage of this guy, George, who's still in my film, who's a primary figure in the film and who has to loom like a ghost. But we only had... A total of less than 30 seconds of him. So how do we maximize this? Um, you know, we have to have him, you know, have a tang. Like, you know, I said to um, to Lawrence that he has to have this kind of, you know, he was static personified. Where, wherever he appears, it's like absence and, and things like that. And so, you know, Lawrence began thinking about this, even though we didn't begin to work together in his studio until the end. 
uh, we kept having these like month, you know, every month or so we would check in and have these long conversations about the film. So it was like finding these uh, collaborators and working with Lucas and, um, you know, and then checking them with um, maybe not pro official producers, but, you know, people at Sundance, people at Center Reach who also supported this movie, uh, who were crazy enough to support this movie and believe in me. Um, and, and, you know, just checking in with them and they, they kind of guided me throughout the way. Uh, Ramel, uh, let me ask you, when, when I met you in 2014, one of the things that struck me about you is, uh, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I felt like you were operating completely outside of the film world. Uh, you were a teacher and you were a photographer and you'd been nurturing this project. You didn't have, you know, uh, producers or things like that. Um, uh, how did you, you know, find those people? Who were the people that became you know, critical to you to helping you realize your vision. Yeah, it was, um, it's a pretty tough process. You know, the, the film is sort of peddling in, um, you know, de relatively decontextualized images from a larger narrative. They're like moments that are spontaneous and whimsical. And so the idea for the film is like, you know, to create meaning by juxtaposition, by movements, by... Um, you know, many arcs and, and many sort of energies. And so, you know, visual literacy, the persons, like the, the, the teams of visual literacy has to be like extremely high um, in terms of like knowledge production. And so, um, you know, I came across, fortunately, I mean, game changer, Jocelyn Barnes, um, really about halfway through the filming process. Um, so then, Jocelyn Barnes, who is no. uh, sitting here in the second row, uh, is a uh, producer who's worked on a lot of uh, very accomplished uh, uh, documentaries, um, works as a producing partner with Danny Glover. And yeah, they have uh, Lover Tour Films um, is our company, and they have made an amazing amount of aesthetically forward, politically relevant, but like deceivingly entertaining um, films. But uh, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to make people laugh at them. <laughs> Um, yeah, so came across Jocelyn Barnes, we like immediately connected, um, and from there it was like all happiness in some sense, you know. Um, was really like sort of frustrated with the industry. There was a couple folks who had taken risk on me, like you, really early on that saw something in, in what was going on, but you know, the sort of expectations for clarity, you know, the sort of expectations for, um, you know. Well, you know, I, I can't remember in 2014 what I, gave to you as advice if I gave you advice. I but, remember. Okay, well, uh, good. I, because, Should I say uh, it, Tom? I, well, <laughs> let, let, me, let me say this first. Like, this would be the last grant you'll ever get. <clears throat> Just kidding. No, no, no. I'm, I, I feel quite positive that if I was saying anything, it was probably nudging you towards something more conventional. Yeah. Well, it was, but, but simultaneously it was... Um, maybe more than nudging. Maybe it was, <laughs> do this, young man. No, basically you were like... Uh, I don't know what the hell you're doing, but I like it. <laughs> you know? And I was like, thanks, Tom. <laughs> it's really kind. And you're like, meet these people. Maybe they can help you. Um, but just to, to, to finish, so, you know, then we, we um, Jocelyn had to work with Sue Kim um, earlier um, on Strong Island. So we brought Sue Kim in, which um, also contributed to the film a bunch. And then we brought in Maya Krinsky, who is um, uh, uh, an artist and a critic that lives, art critic that lives in Rhode Island as well. Um, and then we brought in Rob Moss. Um, who was also a game changer, and then we had like an edit team. So I would I would like edit, and then we would have these really long meetings in which we would all just sort of delve into meaning, the idea of meaning. Um, in in films, it's like really easy. I like to say it's really easy to um, create meaning, but it's really hard to avoid meaning. Um, and for the f this film, in which you're literally peddling in just like images, like the capacity to undermine something, like some moment that you want to, you know, um, some person to really connect with later on is devastatingly, you know, imminent um, at all times. And so that negotiation is really fickle. And yeah, I'm so happy with the team that came together to make it happen. Uh, Tim, you had made some films before, but nothing uh, as ambitious as uh, Three Identical Strangers. Um, who were the people critical to you to you know, help give you the confidence that, that you could do this? Well, no, no one wanted me to make this film. I mean, no one wanted me to direct it. They wanted the film to happen, just not with me directing it. Um, and 
normally when people talk about the struggle to get a film made, you know, I mean, it took four years to get this one off the ground, and that was a nightmare in many respects. But the one thing that was great about that is it enabled me to very sneakily get myself so interwoven into the kind of DNA of the project that no one could get rid of me by the end of it. But I mean, uh, initially, there were all kinds of like Kevin McDonald type people being talked about for it. Um, and so I'm very grateful, actually, ultimately, to, to um, Raw, the production company I, I, I made the film with, is that my exec producer, Dimitri Deganis, who is the producer of The Imposter, you know, they, they eventually uh, decided to take a chance on me, and that was, that was great. In terms of collaborators, I mean, the two key collaborators for me on this film were Becky Reed, who's the producer, uh, who's got a kind of uh, journalistic background, and she did a huge amount of kind of proper journalistic research on this film, going knocking on doors, trawling through archives, um, managed to get this, this experiment opened, which no one had managed to do before. Um, and then the editor, Michael Hart, and all three of us, it was our first feature, and he, you know, He's got a great story. I'm just going to tell you this really quickly. He's this guy. He's my closest collaborator. He came to London, wanted to be an editor, and ended up on all these reality shows and like hated hated it and quit. Went back to Ireland, uh, and that Christmas watched The Imposter, the feature film, at the cinema, and then was like, okay, I, I want to do this still. Moved back to London, and he ended up. He looked up the production company that made it, and 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 took whatever job he could find. And uh, and I I was uh, I was the exec producer on this not particularly brilliant series about uh, Heathrow Airport. And Michael was like the last editor. We hired like the most junior editor. And he cut on this kind of docu-series about an airport, the best film with the dregs of the material. And he was clearly the most talented editor. And we had much more experienced editors. So from then on, we've had this kind of relationship. And on this film, I uh, at one point, I was going to work with Danny Boyle's editor, who's a, who's a friend. Um, and at the last minute, he had something big come up that he couldn't turn down. And I think we were sort of going, oh, who are we going to get? And I, let's, let's try Michael. And, you know, it's his first feature. He hasn't cut all that much stuff before this. And he just worked like a Trojan. I mean, he, we cut the whole film in 18 weeks, which for, for a feature doc is, like, really, really tight. Um, and so the three of us, I think, going through it together as kind of quite naively as we did was actually... A, it's been a really good experience, you know. And I, and I think the fact that we didn't have anyone apart from Dimitri really um, super experienced attached to the project was was a good thing because we were all just trying to do our best and supporting each other through it. I'm so envious hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Which bit? Uh, all of it. Like having to work alone is incredibly lonesome. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think that um, the collaborative aspects of filming, uh, filmmaking and what I like, you know, when people talk to me about, you know, and I studied film and film theory at university and people, you know, learn about the auteur, th auteur theory and everything. And I, I just... Of course, you have a vision as a director, but the people you collaborate with are like... I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't have got through it without them. It's a really tough film. So, yeah, I mean, when you guys... I mean, yours are much more kind of personal vision films where you're, like, at the centre of it. I mean, I, yeah, I, that must be so tough. This is a question I should have asked off stage instead of on stage, but I'm going to plow ahead. Have uh, the three of you seen each other's films? Yeah, you, of course. Okay. C can, I, can I just jump in just really quick? I am I genuinely like really excited to be here because w when you, ma you know, if you get a film that's kind of on the circuit and going around film festivals and stuff, there are a load of us going around and they're all good films and stuff. But genuinely, these two are like probably my favorite from, from the year. But Tim is the nicest guy and in the world. No, so. no, no, but they yeah. really are. Like Sandy's Sandy, film. Sandy, you said that before about someone else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she said that very <laughs> about I was on the same stage but as no, you. <laughs> just to say, I mean, when I saw Sandy's film initially, uh, immediately I was like, this is a kindred spirit. And like anyone who like loves cinema, not just documentary, but like all forms of storytelling. I was like, I, I just feel like I know you. And Ramel's film is, is, not a f is not the kind of film that I would normally go and see, that sort of impressionistic, kind of more art, art, art end of the spectrum film. I went to see it at True Falls, and it, t I mean, it honestly floored me. I was actually crying watching it. I mean, it really, it just got to me in a way that I just didn't, I didn't, I sort of got, someone invited me along to it, and it just really affected me on a kind of really, I don't know, fundamental level. So to be on a panel with these two guys is like really exciting for me. Thanks, we've Tim. Been, we've, been, we've been traveling together yeah. since then, and so we kind of like, we're old horses. Yeah, I haven't, um, I saw um, Sandy's film at Two Falls, and uh, I was like immediately hypnotized. And I haven't seen Tim's, but I told him that just watching the trailer, I was like, it's, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. And I told him it's going to come to all the theaters in my town, so I can't, I can't spend time watching it now. And he was like, I respect that. You, uh, people talk about a f 
finding a film in the edit room. And uh, I've heard uh, some of you talk a little bit about that, but I'd like to go a little bit more deeper um, into that uh, idea. Uh, Ramel, can, can you talk about you know, what happened in your editing process that allowed you to find your film? Geez, Tom, that's, that's probably the biggest question you could have asked because um, like the film is, it's literally a puzzle, you know, like it's not, and, and you could say that about any film because all films are edited unless it's like one shot, but then it's kind of edited because you have a beginning and an end, but like it's, it's, there's varying degrees of puzzleness, you know, and this is like a one million piece puzzle. Um, specifically with, once again, like the capacity to like usurp something that you can't predict. Like the film is built to be a sort of like, you know, to, you know, like most, most films are, are interested in like walking someone through the woods. Like it's a path, you know, like the, our film is like trying to put you in the woods and allowing you to just like have this experience of an atmosphere. And so the editing process was... You know, it was actually quite fun now to think about it because you get to, I think the, I'll just, I'm not going to, there's too much to, to, to say as I'm sure for, for the two other panelists as well. What I will say, um, because I've said it before, um, is that the, the most beautiful thing about the film is because we're dealing like, we're intentionally dealing directly with someone's subjectivity and trying to engage that with as much agency as, as, possible, as possible through openness and through ambiguity. Um, you're confronted with your personal truth on a daily basis, which is something that is just important and generative. You know, like I'm like Joss, Rob, Maya, like this is what these three images are doing together, and this is how it's gonna do this. And then Jocelyn's like, well, actually, I like this one a little bit shorter, and this is what it's doing, actually. And then Rob's like, well, you know, both you two know what you're saying, but it's actually more like this. And then Maya's like, it's doing this. And you have to negotiate. Um, the way that you perceive the audience is going to respond to that in accordance with the spirit of the film. You know, like we're, we're trying, we're obviously carrying the way in which an audience views it. But I mean, yeah, so it's, it's like, it's, it was quite beautiful. Like you leave and you're like, I know myself better um, because I have, you know, people that I trust who have points of view that are conflicting with mine that are just as true. Um, and that's like really, Rewarding. Uh, Sa uh, Sandy, uh, you talk about the uh, vitality of your collaboration with this former barista, skateboarder, uh, editor, um, uh, and the importance of the Not CD earlier in the process, kind of setting you down the path of making this more a personal film. Once you were down that path, and once you were, you know, in the groove of uh, finding it, what, you know, what else did you have to discover in the edit room? Um, everything. It was, um, I guess it was like nine months of me just sitting in my garage with Lucas, but um, it wasn't just completely nine months with him. Uh, it was like, he, I worked with him for seven and a half months and then he kind of was completely expired and exhausted and was just way too much because we, you know, his skill was just, a lot of it was graphic, like moving things around and trying out moves with me and, um, and like discovering the story. Out of the garage sometimes? Sorry? Did you let him out of the garage? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For 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 smokes and what uh, skating, I guess. Um, but but we, you know, like the thing is, um, part of it was me not wanting um, not wanting George because George loomed large, and within the editing, um, you know, within George the, the, being the, char the character, the character who steals character in the, the film. film. Yeah, the, the the ghostly character. Um, you know, I got a new subject who was willing to talk during the edit. So we had to, I had to fly over to New Orleans and, and, and grab this interview and then insert it in. And, and then there was gonna be like more George. Um, and he was, he, George was gonna threaten to take the story away from us. And how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you stop that from happening is um, you just have to, you know, just really, really try out different things and just pull, pull them out, like just, take things out that, that are so tempting to leave in, storylines that just, you know, are gonna, are gonna like maybe hijack this film for a second time. So you don't do that. Um, so I ended up with Lucas for seven and a half months, um, you know, doing the, um, the kind of coming of age story of me growing up and making this film and then 
kind of growing up and becoming a kind of a detective of my own life and solving this mystery of what happened and gathering my friends and all of that. Um, there came a point where Lucas, um, being a young man, was, and I knew this was happening, that um, he just didn't want me to seem unlikable as a, as a female character. It's, it, you know, like a lot of people are very afraid to go there with female characters, and I just thought, I just knew that I had to work with a, a, a kind of an older, more experienced female editor, so I brought on a second editor whose name is Kimberly Hassett, greatly underutilized, greatly talented, and working mostly as, as a producer now, but extremely intuitive and talented as an editor, and she came on f for the final five weeks, and... And she would let you be unlikable. Um, well, no, no, she, she, you know, women are much harder on ourselves. We, we kind of would go there and, and talk about these difficult things and, and some of the things that, the, the things I admit to that may not be so flattering, um, you know, that are true to life. And, and because this is a documentary about me and my friends, I was so concerned that we had to have, we had to reflect how, how things are and how my relationships with my friends are and how it was that we got to make this film when we were 19 and what kind of personality I was and what kind of person I am now. Um, and we had to be honest in capturing that. So, um, you know, we, we, so Kimberly um, went there with me and um, that, was, that was completely instrumental and, and important in the process where we then left these holes in the edit where I knew that I was gonna be working with Kimberly and then we would fill in these holes with um, deeper, kind of more mature understanding. And then from, from there we kind of fashioned the entire thing and it became the seamless, beautiful thing um, with um, Lawrence's help, <laughs> the, the, the sound designer who came in and just smoothed all the kinks. Uh, Tim, uh, compared to Hale County or Shirkers, Three Identical Strangers has more of a straightforward uh, chronology uh, to it. Um, but uh, I don't imagine that necessarily made it an easier uh, process in the edit room. What were the things that you had to find in the edit room? Yeah, I mean, we, we, as, as mentioned, we were like under real time pressure to kind of get through the edit. I mean, I think that um, although the, the narrative is quite linear in, in certain respects, and it's, you know, obviously quite a commercial film, um, I, I always felt like we were going to combine all these different aspects of documentary filmmaking, like I mentioned earlier, and, and, and definitely me and Michael, the editor, you know, shared a lot of influences, you know, from Errol Morris to, um, I don't know, Asif Kapadia to James Marsh, people like that. You know, we watched a lot of docs. We also watched a lot of, you know, bad Hollywood movies, like, uh, or, or, or average Hollywood movies, like the Michael J. Fox film, The Secrets of My Success, was like a reference point for the 80s sequences and then we were watching kind of a born identity for kind of the sort of identity thriller aspects of the film. Um, I guess working out, w the, the, the biggest challenge with my film was working because it, it works on, I mean like all the good films, it, it, it works on different levels. You know, you, you, you've got this um, brilliant family story, human story, quite tabloid of these brothers separated, reunited um, and then also separated again. But then you've got this these other thematic arcs that are playing across the story, and we really thought a lot about them, you know, about the, the film moves from a position of thinking, you know, um, nature is really dominant and the importance of nurture. And it's also um, a, a journey of discovery, the, the experiment which separated the triplets, this secret experiment locked at Yale till 2066. There's also a sort of journey of discovery with the study going on there as well. So there was a lot to kind of inter interweave, and we really, the bits we, where we had it in the past tense, we really worked hard at kind of plotting it as tightly as we could. And, and I wanted things, you know, seed information here and then pay it off here, you know. And it, it was exciting for me to combine that kind of really meticulous um, granular filmmaking with the kind of observational investigative stuff where we don't know where it's going to go. And one of the challenges getting the film off the ground was people were like, what's the third act? Where's it going to go? And I was like, well... It's it's a documentary. You don't. That's the whole point. You don't necessarily know where you're going to end up. But but I think because the first two thirds or first half were so densely plotted, and we could see all the story elements and stuff, um, the people really freaked out by that more observational aspect. And, and getting that all to work together was a kind of real. It really screwed with your mind in the edit. We had you know post its everywhere and graphs mapping kind of emotional arcs and all this kind of stuff. Um, well, I think a, a special challenge in Three Identical Strangers. Uh, that I remember experiencing when I first watched it is the first 10 minutes of the film is one of the most incredible stories you've ever heard. And I remember thinking, where does this go from here? Yeah, I mean, you burn through so much story in the first 15 minutes. You sort of, a lot of people have said to me, I just didn't know, what, I, I thought you, would, you just wasted it kind of thing. And there was a lot of pressure on us to make it more like um, a Netflix series or something like that. And there's certainly 
enough story to do that. But I always, I always like films like narrative and documentary where there's like a surplus of story, where it's so dense that you actually probably have to come back and watch it again and you'll get something completely different from it. And I was always very... There was a lot of pressure on me to kind of make it into a series, and I was always really focused. Like, no, this this needs to be told in one sitting in a cinema. If people need to watch it again, that's fine. You know, I'd rather have too much in than too little. Yeah, when you asked me what I thought about that film, like, it was so, I mean, it seemed like such a seamless, difficult, seamless thing that was so easily done. But I, when I was watching it, I knew how difficult and all that the kind of micro and macro things you were doing, and I was like so impressed by the, the fact that it works as such an entertaining thing and was a huge box office hit. And But you know, when you're watching as a filmmaker, you're thinking, oh my God, all the work that has gone into this, th that was what was going through my head in full adm admiration, so. Thank you. Um, I've been foregrounding uh, style in this conversation, but I wanna uh, spend the last part of this talking about uh, the interactions you had with the subjects uh, in your film and the responsibility um, that you felt towards the subjects uh, in your film. Ramel, you talked about one of your goals in Hale County is wanting to do something different than other, you know, cliches and representations that uh, you'd seen in, in other films. The lives of the, of the people in your film are complicated lives like anyone has a complicated life. And, um, and I wonder how you thought about representing them and, and, and since the film has been out, how that uh, relationship has uh, evolved. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. I will, I will say, though, that there's, like a, I, I, there's a really, a, to me, a strong line between style and form, you know? Um, and very much, I, I think, personally think that Hell County is peddling in form and not style. Um, Style is very much veneer. It's very much trend. It's very much, um, and I don't mean those pejoratively. I mean those just to distinction. And form is very much like you know the the literal material of the sculpture, you know, or the actual sh shape of it, not the sort of camera style or the. Um, and so, with that being said, what was really important for Hell County was that you know you don't you don't get to consume the film. You know, you're not like given. You're not like given the story or like given the narrative because if you, you know, and this is coming from a, pers a, a you know, a, a, a very perhaps overly conscious African American photographer, artist, filmmaker, whatever, that is like knows that most stories about black folks are connected to struggle, connected to slavery, connected to this, and they're like given to people and people consume them. And that kind of becomes the entire history, the entire narrative, the entire everything. And so how do you, to me, that's a big problem because, you know, I think that we're bigger than a variety of ways in which we've been depicted. And so how do you address those things? It's to, like, not, not let someone easily consume the protagonist or the characters, you know? Make someone invest their imagination and then force you to reflect on the fact that, Oh, I actually have only seen these types of representations because now that I'm only now that I'm seeing this, like this is new. But like, why is this new? Because it's it's banal. It's has to do with. It takes a long time to get. Like the film is very anti, is very time forward. Like very anti industry in that. Like you have to spend time to 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 find these moments, which has not happened in the past. And so for those in the film, um, it was literally like. They were, we weren't even making a film because I spent so much time with them. You know, we were just hanging out, and I always had the camera. Um, but we're just playing video games. We're like playing basketball. We're watching. You know, sometimes I'm filming, sometimes I'm not. We're literally just chilling. I like to to say that I was like, you know, not there to to capture their lives, but to participate in their lives. You know, Ramel, can I just ask? I'm, I was really interested about this. Like, how much did you did you explain to them the kind of form that the film was going to take, and how much did that your contributors think that they were just going to be in a, I don't know, like a normal kind of observational documentary. Yeah, it's like impossible to, to for them to to know, but also for me to know. Like this project wasn't intended to be. I mean, it was intended to be seen, but like I had no idea. You know, I, I was two and a half years I was shooting before the first grant we submitted to was the Garrett Scott, and so the guys didn't even know what Sundance was. You know, um, for them, for me to go from shooting with this little camera. And then for it to all of a sudden be in a theater with 300 people watching was, was kind of, I mean, it was jarring for even them. They were like, that's what we were doing the whole time? Because I'm just shooting and we're just hanging out, you know? Um, 
which I think is, is really fascinating. I was already making photos of them with them, with my large format camera, and so they saw some of those and knew that like, I wasn't, interesting, wasn't interested in clarity. You know, I, w I was interested in um, the unexpected, and so they didn't expect anything traditional. I told them that I would, it would be like a sort of fractured narrative rebuilt together to do something. Um, and they were like, all right, like, when are we going to go get some food, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, Sandy, uh, in Shirkers, there are all, th th this group of friends that you went through this intense experience with uh, in your teens, um, you know, different hurt feelings uh, from that time. And, uh, and now you had to come back and, um, and tell a story uh, about it. What responsibility did you feel to the, the people that you were documenting, and, um, and, and how did that evolve as the film has been out in the world? Um, I, I just wanted to really capture what it was like to be friends and remain friends, you know, troubled friends, but, you know, female friendships are often troubled um, over time. And um, I just wanted to make sure that we captured the kind of texture of that in real life and just be true to that and be honest and, you know, um, and so, it was, it was, I did a lot of, you know, coaxing of my friends to get involved in this thing, um, you know, because it's such a toxic subject, um, the whole George Cardona stealing the, the film and how it sucked our lives into this vacuum for, you know, 20 years before it was returned to me. Um, all this kind of stuff was, the very mention of Shirk is just, just, is so bad with, with me and my friends that it took a lot of coaxing uh, and a lot of research into, you know, just like just talking to them and making, you know, just reaching out to them over like months before I began interviewing and then hiring. I think one of the crucial things is hiring the perfect, the correct uh, cinematographer who is, um, who I, I picked um, Iris Ng, who's this really tiny um, Chinese-Canadian woman who had also shot stories we tell for Sarah Polly and had done similar, very intimate interviews um, where she was very unobtrusive. It was like, I have friends who are like these tall, gigantic um, Caucasian guys who were great DPs who were just mad at me for not hiring them, but it was just crucial for me when you're dealing with a, you know, very nervous subjects who are gonna reveal themselves to, to have somebody they were gonna be comfortable with and who's gonna like vanish into she's like she's about this high and and like when she's shooting with a giant camera she kind of makes herself into like this high like she becomes really tiny I mean she's probably in the room she's she's in duck she's at duck NYC um, so I'm saying this for her friends um, but you know who know her that she would vanish and just be poker faced and these so Jasmine and Sophie were just like talking at me as if we were con continuing a conversation that we just had and it was very important that we captured that truth of how we talk to each other because we're not gonna get a second chance. We're not gonna rehearse. Like one of them, Jasmine insisted that we had to run lines beforehand. I said, no, we're not, we're not gonna, this is not a film, this, we're gonna capture reality. And this, so we, it was, um, it was also like really important to just seem like you're, it's casual. But to, to, to walk into a room and seem casual requires so much work and so much like I don't know, head work and, and just a lot of just preparation and walking in uh, to people who are nervous, who are not used to being subjects, who some of them might be filmmakers and even more like conscious of being a subject. So having to overcome all of that took a lot of, um, you know, preparation. And then you walk in and you seem like you're just winging it. So Tim, as we wrap this up, I wanna ask about your relationship with the subjects in Three Identical Strangers. Uh, these are men who particularly early in the, the cycle of this story, when, when it first became a news story, as we see in the trailer, that these three triplets separated at birth had rediscovered each other. They were in the media a lot, um, and, uh, and not as much experience with, uh, with that uh, since then. Now you're telling what has now become the, you know, the, the, I don't know if I want to say the definitive version of their story, but the most known version of their story. Um, what has that process been like for you and in, in, in the responsibility you feel to those subjects? It, it's really tough. Um, th th they, you know, as I say, it took four years to get off the ground. Part of that was getting funding, but a big part of that was earning their trust. You know, when you, when you see the film and you, you understand what they've been through, you understand why they find it hard to, to trust people. Um, and also, you know, around their, their, their um, 15 minutes of fame in the 80s, I think a lot of people promised them, we're going to make a movie with you and this and that, and it never kind of paid off. Um, 
I was really worried that they, because they had done all this media stuff before, that they were going to be very jaded in the retelling and it was just going to be like this rote, here's my story kind of thing. But once we finally persuaded them to do it, and once they agreed to do it and turned up, and, and, and the first day of interviews, I was like, I didn't, we had the studio, we had all the lights set up, and I just, I didn't know if they were going to show up. But when they did show up, what they, they were just, you know, what you're looking for as a filmmaker is kind of emotional honesty. That's where the connection between the audience and the contributors occur occurs, you know. And I think sometimes people think documentary should be the, this dispassionate thing where we just kind of tell the facts of, of, a, of a case or a story or whatever. But I, I, I completely reject that. I think you're looking for emotional honesty and emotional truth. And what was surprising to me is when they sat down for the interview, they were willing and able to tap back into the emotion that they felt when they were experiencing this for the first time. And I think it may be just because it was so, the events were so seismic and crazy um, that, and not just them, all, the, all their friends, you know, they, they just, they were there when they were talking about it. And, you know, I'd love to say, oh, that's my skill as a, as a filmmaker, you know, and maybe that was a small part of it. But I think, you know, your film is only ever gonna be as good as your contributors. And they were, they were prepared to go to these emotional places that, that I didn't expect, you know, and, and showing them the film at the end, one, one of the things that was amazing, they both loved the film, which was great, but they both, we showed it to them separately because they weren't getting on at the time, which was, uh, again, you can see it in the film, but it's a very hard part of the, uh, the filmmaking process. And, um, but separately, they both came up and hugged me and it was like, it wasn't because they liked the film, which they did. It was because I followed through and my team followed through on what we said we were going to do. And just that simple act of doing what we said we were going to do was like such a big deal for them. It almost didn't matter what the movie was like. It was like you did what you said and thank you for that. So, um, yeah, but I, I, just one thing to add, you know, you, you guys out here in America, you tend to use the term, the term subjects to describe people in documentaries. And I guess... In the UK, the tradition I've been brought up in, we tend to call them contributors. And, I, and particularly on this film, because you know, they were subjects of a human experiment that they didn't know they were part of, um, I always felt uncomfortable using the term subject. And I was very conscious, I think, that the, the power wielded by scientists over their research subjects is the similar to the power we have as documentary filmmakers over our subjects. And it's really, you know, when you point a camera at someone and you've got lights and you've got them in a room, you can ask them pretty much anything. And most people, you know, they'll go there. Um, and, and that's a huge responsibility. And I think it's incumbent on us to just yeah. be mindful of that every single day we're filming and we're editing. Can I uh, follow? Yeah, I, I, uh, I never say subjects. I kind of openly reject it as well. I say protagonist. Because you know it's just just nice. It's like very forward thinking, but also it speaks specifically as relate to black imagery, like the sort of use of photography and film as science, as if there was like something legitimately scientific about re reducing reality to a two dimensional plane, you know. Um, and so I'm really happy you said that. And yeah. it's such a, the con the scientific connection to yours is so damning. I didn't even think about that in terms of the idea of subject. That must be like painful for them to even hear. Like, yeah, and I think yeah. also, and there were weird things in the, yeah, I, just this minor thing about the character, but when you're getting people to talk about the kind of emotional things that they were talking about, in the past, the small documentary I made in the UK, we'd always provide psychological counselling or a psychotherapist, you know, as part of that process, just to support them. But there was a whole ethical debate we had to have about whether it was even appropriate to make that offer in the first place because of what they'd suffered at the hands of psychologists and psychotherapists. So it was a really, the whole thing was quite fraught. In my case, it was my, 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 my subjects were my friends. I don't call them subjects because the, my, I was the only connection with, between all of the characters. So, I mean, characters, but they're, they're my friends, basically. Um, and actually, I have to say that Sundance, when we showed this film at Sundance, was the first time me, Sophie, and Jasmine were the three protagonists in this film, I guess, my film. Were the first was the first time we were in the same room together in 20 years, so that was a pretty emotional kind of um, for them to un, you know, unveil this thing for them to see at the same time as everybody else was seeing it. So that was pretty something. Can I say one more thing, Tom? I know you you had you did the mic like a couple of times. Like <laughs> Jesus. Um, we'll no, shut up. <laughs> no, I wanted to say I, from listening to Sandy talk about her film right before Tim went. Um, one thing that I remember watching it is the like the honesty between the tension of uh, her friends and herself lent a, like so much credibility to the story. I agree. And That's my favorite bit. Yeah, like and uh, you, then they she would like cut back to stuff and all of a sudden like you could now engage in everything that's in the same way that Sandy is like I needed to show people the film in order for them to believe that it happened. Like once that happened, then everything that she was saying like took on a new 
sort of truth because no one's in, in I mean, not many, not out, no one, but like it's difficult to be real about like the problems you have with people, you know, like yeah, that's one you, thing you always and then hide. You just show, yeah. you just show, and that behavior it's, says everything. Yeah. It's so it's so unsparing your film, you know, you don't, you don't, um, give yourself, you, you don't soften anything towards yourself. It's really critical, self-critical, and, and, and not just self-critical, other people, you include other people being critical of you. That I, but I just found a, as a, the portrait of female friendship in there, just something I, I, I don't think I've seen before, on, on in, in a, certainly in a feature doc. I think it's crucial to have um, kind of mature female uh, collaborators with, with me on doing that, because it was, it, otherwise it was just gonna be me, um, f you know, fighting that battle and nobody, wanting to me to be unlikable. So, you know, if you're a female filmmaker trying to deal with difficult subjects, try to work with uh, female filmmakers as well and try to get them on your side. I want to thank Tim Wardle, Sandy Tan, and Ramel Ross for joining me at Doc NYC. You can find Hale County this morning, this evening, and Three Identical Strangers on iTunes and other platforms. You can find Shirkers on Netflix. I conducted previous interviews with Tim Wardle on episode 81 and with Sandy Tan on episode 87. If you're in New York City, join us for Pure Nonfiction at IFC Center. Every Tuesday and occasionally a Thursday, we show a documentary followed by a conversation with the filmmakers and other special guests. Upcoming dates include Alex Gibney with his new film, The Inventor, on Thursday, March 14th, and Alison Clayman with her film, The Brink, on Tuesday, March 26th. For details, go to purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer, Hannah Nordenswan, and web designer, Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can find me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at Pure Nonfiction. Dot net.